So the recorder is on, the audio it looks good, the video looks good, we are recording right now. Um, so we're going to get started, okay? We'll get started you know, with today's class. Um, the reason why I went back to my own video, you know, is because I wanted to talk, I want to know what I talked about in the previous class, which is last Monday. Because last Wednesday, we talked about exam two, and we did not talk about any new material as far as the instruction is concerned. So that's why, you know, I have to go all the way back to, um, you know, the 30th, you know, which is the last day that we talk about, you know, the topics for this class. Um, I believe that I have made several, you know, attempts to recommend people to go through the exercise that I go through in order to find out how instructions work, okay? Um, that is really important, you know, because, you know, that will help you to get familiarized with the architecture as well as, you know, how things are connected inside the processor. Um, that, that's basically the way to study for this class, you know, at least at this point of this class is really to go through those you know, steps, okay? Decode a particular opcode, and then observe you know, how things are connected in the processor, what multiplexers are configured, what the multiplexers are configured in order to get something, you know, get two things connected. All right? So do we have any questions about any of the previous topics that we have talked about, or any questions about exam two, which is gonna happen on Wednesday? It is in the announcements. Oh, okay. Yep. So if you go look through the announcements, you know, that should be it. That should be there. And then if you look at the um, recording on um, November first, you know that is also you know fully recorded for this class. So we got you know both of those you know already done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yep. <coughs> All right, so without any further, you know, questions, but I'm going to pause just a little bit more. Do we have any additional questions about exam two or the topics that we have gone over so far? Okay, I don't see any. All right, well, that's okay because, you know, uh, my office hour is right after lab today, which is starting at 1.30. So for people who do have some questions, but they don't want to ask it in class, you can just come to my office hour and then we can talk about those during my office hour. So I'm going to get started with today's material um, and I am going to start with the opcode table because there are certain funny things that you, some people might have noticed and you will know, go like, hmm, those things are kind of interesting. So what we'll do is we're going to start with and XY and also or XY here. So when you look at this, okay, the question is, what if X and Y are the same register? What do you think is going to happen? In other words, in terms of the RTL, okay, the register transfer language description, you would end up with the same registers as X as well as Y. So what do you think is going to happen? Of course, that depends on you know, what is a bitwise AND versus a bitwise OR. So the question is, what if you are ending the same register, or what if you are oring the same register? What do you think is you're going to get back? So that's the first question. I'll let you guys think about it a little bit when I start up my uh, tablet, so I can actually you know, kind of go through a few uh, descriptions. So go ahead and think, you know, how what is, what do you think is going to happen when you bitwise end the same registers? What is the result, you know, in that calculation? That is basically what I want to ask. Okay, so there we go. <clears throat> so I did get a new tablet. You know, this one is actually in color, you know, which is nice because you know, I can actually see what you guys are seeing on the tablet itself. I don't have to look at the screen to find out what color is being selected. So otherwise, it's about the same thing that I have already used. Um, See, and this is the Monday Wednesday class. I'm going to create a folder just for that. And uh, the other thing that's nice about this setup is I can actually use my PC keyboard to interact with the um, the tablet. So uh, this is the actual PC pen. This is the Monday Wednesday class. And you can even click, and yeah, it's kind of nice to be able to do both at the same time. <clears throat> 
right, so we are creating a new node here. All right, so to answer that question, okay, so let's figure out what is going to happen when we are ending two things together. But the first thing we need to do is to look at the truth table. So once again, we have truth table. If we consider x and y as two independent variables, so all we want to do is to figure out what is x and y. Okay, so I'm going to use the C operator here. And also what is x or y, which is also using the C operator. X can be zero, y can be zero. When x is still zero, y can be one. Y, x can be one, y can be zero, x can be one, and y can also be one. So you know, I hope this is starting to become something that you kind of just, you, know, <clears throat> you can remember. Okay, with two independent Boolean variables, we have four rows in the truth table. So with the x and y, okay, you know, when both x and y are both false, um, you know, then x and y is going to be false. When both are false, you know, x or y is also false. And then when both are true, then we have you know, true for the conjunction as well as true for the disjunction. And in this case, I don't even care about the other two rows. In other words, these two rows over here is not even of any importance because what I want to do is to find out what happens when you bitwise end you know, the same thing. What if you have a bitwise or with the same thing? What do you think you're going to get? Okay, first of all, yeah, go ahead. And would be zero? And, and or would be one? No. Wait. You're gonna get up, you're gonna end up with the same thing. Oh. Because you know, when X and Y are the same, then you're only looking at either the first row or the fourth row. Which means the result of the operator is the same as what you start off with. Is that okay? <clears throat> in other words, in a circuit sense, okay. In a circuit sense, what I'm really asking is what if you have an AND gate here and you're feeding the same you know, value as to the both inputs of the AND gate? Or, you know, what if you have an OR gate here and you're feeding the same you know, value to both of the inputs of the OR gate, then the output and the input would be identical. Does that make sense? Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> So the next thing we need to understand is what is bitwise OR versus a logical OR. So a bitwise OR is basically saying you have x0, y0, and all the way to x7, and then y also goes to y7, okay? So the answer is, what if you have your x bitwise OR with y? So looking at both of these you know, as an entire 8-bit pattern. So let's call the result Z, okay? So we'll call the result Z over here. So basically, z of i is going to be x of i, logical or, or logical and, in this, logical and in the other case, with y of i. Is that okay? Does everybody understand that this is referring to the 8-bit pattern, and this is referring to the individual bit? Okay. But if x and y are the same, then you are really performing a bitwise or, but you're looking only on either the first row or the fourth row of the truth table because X and Y are guaranteed to be the same because I just told you that we are doing a bitwise OR of the same register. Does that make sense? Okay, so that means, you know, if you were to say, what is the bitwise OR of X with itself, because, you know, now we are looking at just your X bitwise OR with itself, then the result is Z is going to be the same as x after the operation because it is as if nothing happened. Okay? <clears throat> so you might ask, so what is the whole point of doing this? Well, the whole point of doing this is to force a register through the ALU and influence the flags you know, that we have talked about. That would be the only purpose of allowing such an operation to happen. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So that means, you know, from that perspective, you know, doing an x bitwise or with x is really doing the same thing as bit, you know, x bitwise and with x over here. I don't need both. So one of the opcode corresponding to these can now be used for something else, okay? I call that hijacking an opcode. Basically, it just means that I'm repurposing the same opcode to perform some other operations, all right?
So this part is kind of important because one of the questions in today's lab is related to this. So when you look at the bit pattern of AND, okay, and if you think about X and Y being the same, so that means you know, the bit, there are four individual opcode, individual opcode that correspond to that, which, is, which would be 11000000, because we're performing a bit wise AND of register A with itself and then store the result back into register A which doesn't really accomplish anything that's particularly useful, except that it has to go through the ALU. And this is one of those instructions that will still affect the, fla the flags register. So now you have to think about, okay, it's an operation, it goes through the ALU, which, which two flags would always be influenced by going through the ALU? So the answer to that question has to do with what is inside the ALU. So that's something that you probably need to investigate. We have talked about that already uh, in the previous class when we talk about compare. Uh, the next one is going to be uh, 1100, because that's just your bitwise ending register B and then store the result back to register B. And of course, you can see your 1010 you know, for XXYY as well as 1111 for XXYY. So those, all of those would be basically ending a register from the register bank. It can be register A, B, C, or D with itself and then have the result to back, go back to the same register that we started off with, which means they serve a purpose, okay? You know, but we only need only and to do that or doesn't have to do it or we just need to have or to do it, but and doesn't have to do it. So what does that mean? So that means <clears throat> when you look at OR, which is 1101, and then we have, you know, let's say, you know, we are ORing register A with itself and then store it back to register A. So that would be mean that we have an opcode of 1101, and these two patterns here is going to be 0000. zero, zero, zero. But that becomes unnecessary because it would do exactly the same thing that AND AA is going to do. OR AA and AND AA will accomplish exactly the same thing. One would go through the AND gate inside the ALU, the other would, would go through the OR gate in the ALU. But in the end, they have exactly the same side effect. Why do I want to have two opcodes that have exactly the same effect? I can just say, okay, we'll keep one, but the other one I can use it to do something else. Does that make sense? So that means I can now repurpose the opcode of, let's say, OR in this case. In other words, 1101, Zero, 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 zero is not going to do this anymore. I can use it to map to some other thing that I think you know, is necessary. So just looking through the column A here, do you see another opcode that would also match 11010000? Okay. So when you look at... <clears throat> This row over here, you go like, oops, okay, I, I meant to do a control click, but I did a shift click. So control click over here. So now you go like, hold on a second here. What does that mean? Because, you know, when X, X, y, when X and Y are the same, it also matches this particular bit pattern, which is 1101, 0, 0, 0, 0. So as it turns out, this is how I hijack a particular opcode to do something that is different. So what is, you know, which one takes precedence? This takes precedence, okay? So when we have, you know, the pattern of 1101 and then the um, bit 01 and bit 23 are the same, then we are actually talking about increment. It is not bitwise or anymore. Are we, are we good so far with that concept? But and, on the other hand, is maintaining, you know, zero, 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 zero. It just means that we are ending register A with itself and then storing the result back into register A because I still need that in order to set the flags accordingly. All right, so I'm going to pause to make sure that, you know, we do not, we, you know, to answer all the questions that you might have with this particular discussion. Yep. Uh, what are flags? The flags? The flags refer to the flags register. So when you go take a look at the architecture, so flags is something that we definitely talked about last time because in order to talk about 
the conditional branch instructions, the JXI instructions, and also the compare instructions, we must have talked about the ALU and the flags inside the flags register. So as a reminder, okay, we can do that. <clears throat> so as a reminder, let me move the <coughs> processor into view again. So as a reminder, uh, the flags register or the flags are determined all the way over here. So these output bits are basically the flags. So we have a C flag, Z flag, S flag, O flag, and this is basically the L flag. Okay. So does it kind of help remind you of your, the discussion that we had? Yes. Okay, excellent. So as it turns out, okay, you know, when you look at you know, how the flags are actually influenced by the output, this is the actual output of every single operation that has to go through the ALU. You can see how the sign flag here is always affected. You can also see how the Z flag is always going to be affected. So those are the two that are important, okay? Because when you do an AND regist a register A with register A itself, it will still influence these two. So can someone tell me when the S flag is going to be a one? The S flag is one if and only if, what is the property about the output? of the operation. The Sorry? The first sign is a one. Yep, that is correct. So if and only if the result of the operation ends up with bit seven being set, don't care about any of the other bits, then the sign flag is going to be a one. What about the Z flag? Under what condition do you think the Z flag is going to be set after a whatever operation that we are talking about? Orbits are zeros, very good, which means the result itself is zero. Okay, very good. Okay, so those two things here, one of those two things is super important in today's lab. But the technique of using AND AA, AND BB, AND CC, AND DD in order to examine the register is going to be quite useful throughout the rest of this class. So that's a really useful technique. I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of how to use that technique using the AND AA your kind of instruction. Great, okay, so that's good. Now there are a few more things that are kind of important in this discussion. Let me go back to the opto table. <clears throat> so when you go back to the opto table, you can see there's an increment instruction, there's also a decrement instruction. And there's one little thing that is important about these two is, okay, if you look at column D, you can see how both basically say no change to the flags register. It's like, how can that be the case, okay? So let's go back to the circuit diagram and find out how that can be the case. So the increment and decrement, they both have to either go through the add or the subtraction, the adder or the subtractor you know, um, circuit components here. Then you go like, okay, so that means they're gonna come out here, they're gonna change S out and Z out accordingly. That the answer is yes, they will change inside the ALU, both the S out and the Z out terminals, okay? So isn't that gonna be output you know, out of the ALU? Because you know, both of these terminals are you know, output here. So we have Z out over here, S out is over here. So bit one and bit two of the output port here correspond to the two flags. The answer is yes, okay? You know, the output port will in fact be changed depending on the result after an increment and a decrement. So how can the flag register not be changed? So the answer to that question is not from inside the ALU, but from outside the ALU. So when you look at the outside of the ALU, this is the flag register. This is the enable of the flag register. And you can see how this is determined by a tunnel called FC or the negation of FC. Then the next thing we need to do is to look up, okay, so what is FC? FC is this Y over here. This is the NAND between ALU EN or ALU enable versus register output one D multiplexer. So that means by changing, so ALU EN is always going to be a one if you want to use the ALU. So we don't have any influence you know, over that particular bit, okay? One input of the NAND gate is guaranteed to be a one. But the other one, ah, we can actually play with that. The reason why we can play with that 
is because when you're incrementing, you're adding one to a register. The question is, where is that one coming from? Okay. Normally, we want that one to be coming from a register, but it's really cumbersome that every time you want to add one to a register, you have to find another register, put a one into the other register, and then add those two registers. You know, that's just, <clears throat> it, you can't do it that way. It's just very, very cumbersome. So instead of doing that, the ALU also has a connection from a constant of one. This is the constant of one. So this constant of one can go through this multiplexer and become in two. So this is how we can add one as a constant to a register. So the question is, how can we connect these two? Okay, if we want to connect this to over here, that means the this is not a this is not my best moment of you know actually drawing the circuit. <clears throat> But the select of this multiplexer is connected to FC. So that means I need um, input one, which is right here, this port is input one, to be connected to the output, which means I need FC to be a one. So how can FC be a one when ALUEN is already a one in order to make use of the ALU? What do you think? We only got one more degree of freedom which is register output one demux. So what do you think register output demux has to be in order for FC to be a one when ALU EN is already known to be a one? It has to be a zero, very good. Because this is a NAND gate, so that means if, if at least one input is a, is a zero, the output is always gonna be a one. Since we already know that ALU EN is already a one, the only other input that can be a one is register output one demux. So, but isn't that gonna mess up something, you know, because it's coming out of the register? Not really, because this is register output one demux. It goes into this particular demultiplexer. So register output one, which is what this wire is representing, is then going to go to the output, which is this multiplexer here, but that's okay. Um, actually, let me think about this. This is going to be a zero, which means it's going to go to the other one. So this is going to be the other one. But since you know we are not going to use this multiplexer in the instructions that use the ALU, this multiplexer is not even going to be of any significance because RAM is not even being in use. If RAM is not in use, the purpose of this multiplexer is really to control who connects to the A port of RAM. But if no one is using RAM, why do I care? Is that okay? So <clears throat> you can probably feel that, hmm, this feels like a little hack job, okay? This, felt, this feels like a little thing that Tech did afterwards you know, to, to remedy the lack of an increment instruction. If you get that sense, it's like, yeah, this looks kind of hokey, then you would have been correct. This is hokey, but it gets the job done, okay? Because I can, because of the way I structure the instructions, I do not have one that needs to use both the ALU and need to access RAM at the same time so I can use this trick. So that is the whole reason why you can have increment and decrement, okay? There are two things interesting about those two instructions. One is it only needs one, one register. It does not need two registers because the other input is coming from a constant of one. Two is neither of those would change the flags register. Why? Because the flex register enable is the opposite of FC. When FC is a one, meaning that I'm using the constant of one, it will automatically turn off the flex register. So even though the ALU will continue to set you know, the value for its flex out port, the flex register is saying, I don't care. I'm not even enabled. I'm not gonna store that. Is that okay? So why do we not want to change the flags register when we are dealing with increment and decrement instructions? Well, as it turns out, later on in this class, we'll see that there are many occasions where we just want to add one to a register, but we don't really care whether it's going to be, um, whether there will be a carry because it's overflowing or whether there's a borrow because it's underflowing. We just do not care. So we don't want it to change the flags register, which was already useful at some point in time. Yep. Like, if FC 
Dance or something? I cannot remember what it stood for. <laughs> uh, FC is also the abbreviation of my late cat, you know, who is firecracker. But I, I doubt that is the reason why I named you FC. Yep. That is a good question. I believe I am, but it doesn't hurt to double check. So yes, I'm recording. The audio is good. The video is still good. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you know, checking you know, just to make sure. Yep. You just like flash control? Flash control, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> I just cannot remember. Yeah, you know, with the other ones I can remember, you know, but with FC I just cannot remember why I called it FC in the search room. <clears throat> Flex control sounds about right. But it also determines you know, the multiplexer that is feeding into into of the ALU. So it has two significance. Cool. All right. So with that said and done, we are transitioning to a whole new module in this class. I only have very few modules just because you know, the way I you know, section off your know, module is kind of large granularity. So what we are doing uh, is we are transitioning to assembly language programming, which used to be the title of this class. This entire class, 16 weeks, is all about assembly language programming. That is no longer the case because you know, of the uh, CID template. You know, uh, it's specified that we also have to go through uh, discussions of the logic inside the processor and also the architecture of the processor, which we did, okay? So that's why you know we have a lot more material than the usual assembly language programming class, you know, just because the um, expectations from four-year universities have changed. So with this one, we're going to start with um, compiling C control structures. So there are a few modules here that you still might want to read. They are really kind of, <clears throat> they can be useful. Um, the first one is submitting TCP ASM files. You go like, how can, how difficult can it be? Uh, I'll leave it you. I will leave it to you to read this particular module. But this has to do with how we turn in homework assignments, especially programs, from here on. So it is it's kind of important to read that. I would say for people who use Macs, this is particularly important because I found that there are no easy ways to edit plain text files and to save files with a certain extension on Macs. With Windows, you still have to be kind of careful because on all of these Windows machines that we have in the lab here, uh, extension hiding is turned on by default. So you have to kind of configure File Explorer to re-enable showing the extension of files. And then when you use Notepad to save a file, you have to go to All Files, specify All Files, then you can control the extension. Otherwise, it will always use .txt as an extension to save a text file, okay? With Linux, never an issue, okay? Because your know, file extensions have no particular meaning in Linux. <clears throat> so that's a useful module. It's really short, okay? Let me just kind of show you how short it is. Okay, that's it. Okay, so it's not a lot, you know, long discussion. It is operating system dependent. So, and as I said a little bit earlier, it is particularly important for people who are using Macs to read this one because you have to identify or you have to learn how to make your built-in editor to default to just plain text file. There's a way to do it, but you have to kind of go through some of the options to do it. So that's kind of important. I have that problem. Yeah. 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 There's a way to do it, you know, because uh, I found that you can go to... Oh. I saw that earlier. I think I found a way to do it. So that's Windows. I think for Mac, there you go. So when you use the program text edit, um, you can use the command plus shift plus V, you know, that will paste it as plain text. Um, there's also an option that you can change in Mac OS. Uh, you basically go to preferences and then go to new documents and format and then change the default format to plain text. Okay. Yeah, so I had to actually do some research to find this because I don't have a Mac, so I have to kind of try to find out you know, how to do it on a Mac, but I cannot reproduce the steps to verify. But thank you, so that's a good verification there. 
All right. <clears throat> so this stuff is important because if you do not turn in a text file, I will be it will be much harder for me to run it. Um, so that's kind of important. Uh, TTP code execution, you know, tracing is also kind of useful. I believe this one talked about the long way of doing it. Okay. Um, so you can use your know, Ripper Spider to kind of do the trick, but that means you have to set it up. And to set up Ripper Spider is also operating system dependent. So this part kind of is optional. I would say it's nice to have it, but you don't have to have it. So for people who are using Linux or Mac OS, uh, this zip file should do most of the trick, okay? So you do have to customize a few things, but there's no difference or very little difference between Linux and Mac OS. If you're using Windows, then you have to follow, follow this link to a GitHub you know, page so that you learn, uh, you can download the file to uh, make use of the same tool, but using PowerShell in Windows. I believe there's also a special requirement of which PowerShell version is needed for this. Um, so you have to kind of pay attention to it. I personally have not tried it because I don't use Windows at all. Um, but anyway, these are the tools that can be useful, you know, from here on because we'll be using a lot of, you know, we'll be writing a lot of code. So being able to trace the code execution and use that as a way to debug a program is going to be very beneficial. All right. <clears throat> so having all you know, said all that, this is the next topic. So this is compiling, and it is actually a surprisingly short module considering the topic here. So the way we do it is we basically transform control structures into something that is flatter. So when I say flat, I basically mean there are no braces. What, what are the purpose of braces in C++ program? Exactly. Okay. It's it's basically a folder. Okay. The braces in C are basically folders. It is called officially it's called a block statement. So you can open brace, put in a bunch of statements, and then close brace. But the entire open brace, close brace, the entire thing can now be considered one single statement. So this is how you can go like, okay, this place here is only expecting one single statement, but I got a bunch of stuff to do. What am I gonna do? Well, open brace, bunch of stuff to do, close brace, because now the open and close brace is now considered one single item, and that's how conditional statements work. So I think it, they, it, 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 it might help to talk about this just a little bit, which is the syntax of conditional statements in C and C++. <clears throat> Most of you are thinking, I know that already. Now that may be the case, okay, but it still doesn't hurt to kind of go through that discussion just a little bit here. Okay, so if I say something like this, okay, this is actual C statement here, and I want you to tell me what you think is gonna happen. So if I say, you know, if x is less than y, um, x gets a value of two, y gets a value of three, else x is gonna value of zero. Okay, so if this is what I type into a text file and I have a compiler to compile this, what do you think is gonna happen? No, I input this into a text editor and then I run a compiler. You know, in other words, you know, in the tool, like a code block, you know, I just say, okay, compile or build the project. What do you think is going to happen to this statement? Assuming the variables are in scope, they're all integer type, blah, blah, blah. So there's no problem with the variables, okay? But what do you think is going to happen when I, quote, unquote, compile this code? Hmm? Error? What kind of error? It's a syntax error. Okay, so we are heading in the right direction. What kind of syntax error on which line? <clears throat> so I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five. These are the line numbers. So on which line do we end up with an error? Yes. 
line three. That is not correct. Okay, line three does not produce an error. One? No. But uh, good guess. Yeah. Okay, so we have already eliminated line three and line one. Okay, line two. No, it's not line two. So we have now eliminated line one, lines one, two, and three. Line four. Yes, line four is the one that has a problem. The question is, why? Not quite. Go ahead. Um, if there's no brackets, the if statement only applies to line two. That is correct. Okay. Line three is considered a statement that is after the conditional statement. It is not a part of the conditional statement. So let me explain why that is the case. So when you look at the C syntax, this is how it would do. It would describe things. This is a keyword, it has to be typed exactly the way it is. The open paren has to be there. And then you have some kind of condition here, which can be a long due to a complex expression. And in this case, it is valid. It is syntactically correct, not a problem. Close paren has to be there. And then the syntax specifies, I can give you one single then statement here. One single statement, which in our case, x equals two, that's one statement right there already. So the compiler, from the compiler's perspective, by the time it compiles line two, it would say, okay, I have just read the then part of the conditional statement. Now I have two things that can possibly happen. I can encounter the else keyword to specify, wait, hold on a second here. This is what I want to do when the condition is false, right? Or I can start the whole new statement. This particular conditional statement has already concluded. So what did they see? By the time it gets to line three, it says, oh, this is not else. So that means the conditional statement has already ended on line two. The else, so by the time, so y equals to three is not even a part of the conditional statement. It is outside of the conditional statement. Line three is going to happen regardless of whether what x is less than y. Okay, but by the time it gets to line four, the compiler says, why am I seeing else here? Okay, because else can only happen when you have a conditional statement that is at the point of, well, I'm not really sure whether there's an else or not, and the, but the conditional statement can potentially have an else. The, else be, the conditional statement has already ended on line two. By the time we get to line four, there is, there's no if to match the else to. Is that okay? Now, why is this discussion important? Because I rely on this understanding of C and C++ when we transform C code into what we call flatter your C code, which, is, which are one of the steps to transform C code into assembly code. So that's why this discussion is really important. This is also important in the sense that when you're writing C code or writing code in anything that is based on C, so that would include C++, it would include Java, it includes your PHP, it would include Perl, it would include Node.js or JavaScript in general, all of those are derived from C and they all understand syntax in about the same way. So that's why, you know, personally, I always use braces just so that I don't run into situations like this. Are we good so far? Okay. And of course, you know, this is a, a good place for people who support Python to go like, oh, we don't have a problem like this because everything is based on indentation, right? You know, there's no uh, braces you know, to start a block and end a block. But you know, then you run into some other syntactical you know, kind of issues too. So there's no actual win-win you know, situation here. It's just a matter of preference. All right, so are we good so far? Okay, so this is a really, really important understanding to understand that in C and C++, there's only one single statement that is associated with the then action of a conditional statement. 
if you got a few things to do, you have to use curly braces. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so getting back to the notes then. Well, actually, I think I'm I, I'm, I'm going to take roll first, you know, just to give you guys a little bit of spacing between the discussion. So I'm going to give you visibility of the role taking activity for today. And then the access code is edgy. I believe you know, this was the role activity when in previous semesters, you know, this is the one that I used when, uh, when we talk about edge sensitive feature swap. So edgy is the access code. Since I wrote the uh, passcode on the whiteboard, I'm going to switch back to the module on the projector. All right. So does anyone need more time you know, to participate in the role taking activity or you guys all good? Okay, all right. So now we're getting back to our discussion here. The original code is gonna be like this, where C is a placeholder of the condition. Block one is a placeholder potentially of a whole bunch of you know statements. So is block two. Okay, so block one and block two are not representing a single statement, they are representing a bunch of statements, potentially. So this is what the code starts off with. So in this particular code, you know, um, the behavior of this code is if and only if C evaluates to true, the only block one will execute. If C evaluates to false, then only block two will you know, execute. But in either case, after we either perform block one or block two, we continue with whatever is after the conditional statement. So are we good with that concept? Okay. So now we want to look at the second piece of code, which is supposed to do exactly the same thing. So a few things that we need to talk about first. One is the go-to statement. So the go-to statement is actually in almost every single programming language, even though we don't usually teach that. In fact, we teach the opposite. We tell people do not use it. Okay. Um, the way it works is when you have a go-to statement, it will, say, it will simply continue execution of where the label is. So in this case, you know, it's go to L1, which means, oh, we'll just continue to execute at where L1 is located. In other words, does it remind you of one of the instructions that we have talked about? I can alter the path of execution. So which instruction would do you, do you think it reminds you of them? The JMPI instruction, exactly. The jump instruction, the JMPI instruction in the TPP instruction set is exactly doing what GoTo is doing. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so we look at this code here and say and ask, okay, we, we have to evaluate two things. What if C is true? What is going to happen? So if C is true, then not C is going to be false which means the then statement is not going to take place. But it has no else statement associated with it, which means whatever block one is, is going to execute if and only if C is true to begin with. After block one, we have an unconditional go to, to go to L2, which is essentially just a place to continue execution after the conditional statement. So that's the behavior when C evaluates to true. The other condition is, what if C evaluates to false? Question? No? Okay. So what if C is false? So if C is false, <clears throat> if C is false, then not C is going to be true. If not C is true, 
then whatever statement that is immediately following the expression is going to execute, which is a go to statement in this case, which means execution continues on uh, at the label L1. And label L1 is at the beginning of block two, then we execute the entire block two. Block two is done, and then we continue execution with whatever is after that. So are you convinced that both pieces of code would accomplish exactly the same thing? Okay, excellent. So what is the value? This is just you know, making things more complicated. Well, the thing is in assembly language programming, there's nothing, there's nothing equivalent to the braces. You cannot block a bunch of instructions and say, treat these things as one single instruction. There's no such concept in assembly language programming. And if you're thinking about, well, tech, that's only because PPP sucks. <clears throat> well, I can already tell you that that is not the case, okay? The ARM assembly instructions, in, uh, the ARM assembler does not have anything like that. The x86 assembler does not have anything like this. It is the nature of low-level programming that we do not have a concept of blocking. All right? <clears throat> so the next one up is the conditional statement, but a simplified one, because there are some occasions where you only have something to do if and only if the condition is true. Okay, so it's a simplified version of the previous one. So in that case, it translates to this code here, where we don't have to worry about the else. So we say, if C is false, not C is gonna be true. In that case, don't do block one, just go to the continuation point and you know, forget about block one, we are not gonna do that. Okay, so that's the only minor difference here. <clears throat> so if somebody is asking, so can I really just look at the simplified conditional statement as the full conditional statement, except block two is empty? The answer is yes. There's nothing wrong with that particular view, except that in that case, this is empty, which means you know, this go-to really doesn't have to be there. So you're, you're basically using some extra code that does not do anything. But otherwise, from the correctness perspective, it's still fine. All right, so we move on to section 3.2, which is talking about what I would call pre-checking loop. Most people, most people just call it a while loop but I like to refer to it as a pre-checking loop because that's the nature of looping, is we check the condition first. So when you look at the behavior in C code, this is the nice looking code. So um, when you first enter this code, um, if and only if C evaluates to true, then you perform block one, but this is the main difference between the while and the if, is after block one, what do we do? We go back. Right? That's the whole idea of a loop, is it goes back. So after block one is done, we go back and re-evaluate C. If and only if C is continu continues to be true, we perform block one again. So we keep doing it like this until C evaluates to false, in which case we continue execution with whatever is after the while loop, which is not shown here. So that's the basic behavior of a while loop. So now we look at this code here and ask, does it do exactly the same thing? It looks more complicated, and in this case, it looks a little weird too, because at least with the previous case, the conditional statement, after the translation, it still has the if keyword, even though it's only followed by a go to, but in this case, the while is completely gone. So we have label L1 defined here, which we don't know why, there, why it's there right now, and then we have a conditional statement that says, if C, if, if and only if C is false, okay, Go to label L2. Where is label L2? It's a continuation point. Does that make sense to you? Okay. But what if C is true? Well, if C is true, not C is going to be false. If the condition of a conditional statement is false, the then portion, which is referring to the go to L2, is not going to happen. If that is not happening, we basically say execution follows through to block one. Now, remember, block one can be a whole bunch of statements. It doesn't matter. Okay, we perform the entire block one. At the end of block one, we have an unconditional go to back to label L1 so that we can go back and re evaluate condition C, or not C to be exact, to determine can we exit now? Because if not C is true, we, we can exit the entire thing. So are you convinced that these two pieces of code would do exactly the same thing? All right. 
There's only one more control structure that I need to talk to in this particular class. So this is a post-checking loop as opposed to a pre-checking loop. I like to name things you know, based on what they do, and then they're named with, you know, in this case, we have one that has a pre, one has a post, and that really helps to emphasize the differences between the two kinds of loop. So this is the way I like to name things, is the name itself help us to differentiate between you know, the, the, the options. So in this case, we have a do while loop, which does not happen very often. So in this case, we have a do block one, which can be multiple statements, while C. So in the high level language, what this means is perform block one the first time, regardless of whether C is true or not, because we don't get to evaluate C after at least one occurrence of block one. So we perform block one first, and then we ask, oh, by the way, is this condition true? Because if it is true, we got to go back and do block one again. But if C is false, then we just go like, okay, we continue execution after the loop. So the translation is kind of funny because it, it looks actually simpler than the C code, the original C code. We have L1 defined first. In this case, block one is a bunch of statements. And only after block one that we have a conditional statement that says, if and only if C is true, then we go perform the then statement, which is go to L1 in case we end up you know, to repeat the whole thing. But if C is false, then we are not gonna perform the then statement, which means we fall through the execution to whatever is after that. All right, so are we okay with this? Are we convinced that in section 3.3, .3, the post-checking loop is also translated correctly? Now, if somebody is asking, do we have to use label L1, L2, you know, when we perform these translations? The answer is no, okay? I'm just using L labels L1, L2 as examples of you know, names that you can use for the labels. Are we doing okay so far with the control structure translations? Okay, all right. So as you might expect, it's like, hmm, well, this will eventually, okay, if you perform these translations to the entire program, eventually your code will not have braces anymore. It won't have quote unquote structures anymore. But you will still end up with the C's, right? You know, because in this case, um, in fact, sometimes we make the C more complicated by negating. So what if C itself is a disjunction of some conjunctions and then inside the conjunctions we have some other things, you know, it's complex. What if C as a conditional statement or a conditional expression is complex? Then we get to section four. So section four is about boiling down the condition in the conditional go-tos to something that is simpler, okay? So every single step or every single section of section four is about how to get rid of a operator inside an expression, okay? So in the case of section 4.1, we have a negation in front of some expression here. How do, we get, how do we get rid of just that negation? So this is the way we do it, okay? Because the original one says, if and only if C is false, we're gonna continue execution at label L1. So the translated code is to say, okay, we cannot do the negation, but we can check C itself. If and only if C is true, we go to label L2. Where's L2? L2 is right here. It's just a continuation point. All it says is, uh, let's just move on because you know, C is true, so we are not gonna go to label L1. What if C is false? If and only if C is false, the then statement does not execute. We don't have an else statement, so that means, oh, okay, if C is false, this entire conditional statement is not gonna do anything. Then we fall through to the next statement, which turns out to be an unconditional branch to label L1. So the answer is, it's accomplishing the same thing as the original statement here, but the condition is now not negated anymore. We just got rid of the negation operator. Is that okay? But C itself can still be a conjunction, and still, can still be a disjunction. So what do we do when we have conjunctions and disjunctions? <coughs> yep. If you take the, the not operator in, in the code, then like, how do I know what's happening along with the C? No, no uh, condition statements. You do this transformation. Whenever you see something like this, you turn it into something like this. 
it makes the code slightly more complicated. It's basically a pattern matching thing. You see this pattern here, you translate that pattern into this pattern here. Are you okay? So when we see something like um, here, right? So the thing is, you know, okay, so by the time we are done with section three, we apply all the rules in section three until none of them is applicable anymore. And you see something like this after the, uh, the translation, then you go like, okay, let's go for section four type of translation. This pattern looks exactly like this pattern here, okay? What label name you use is irrelevant, okay? So then you translate that into something that looks like this. Obviously, we cannot reuse label L1 and L2 exactly the same way, but we are basically using one more label definition, which is L2, one more go to over here to accomplish the same thing as the original uh, code, but without the negation, the, the Boolean negation anymore. We are complicating the statements in order to simplify the expression. That's basically what section four is about. Is that okay? Now, why are we doing that? Okay, so let me just kind of bring this up in you know, one level of context. The way, the reason why we are doing this is because we know how to do a go-to in assembly language programming because that really is just JMPI. Okay, so we don't have a problem with translating things to require more label definition. We can define labels in you know, TTJSM, not a problem. We can have go-tos, which is basically just JMPI. We don't have a problem with that either. But we cannot have expressions other than the Boolean expressions. The only thing we can really say, is this go do that, is this go do that, are the JXI instructions. Branch is an only if something after compare usually. Uh, two things are the same, or the first is less than the second. Those are the only actual Boolean expression we can evaluate in assembly language programming. So when you have something more complex than that, then we have to reduce the complexity of the Boolean expression. So that's what section four is all about, is to boil everything down to the elemental stuff that we can translate into assembly language. Is that okay? All right, okay. So I, I hope giving you the context of doing this can help a little bit in terms of, you know, uh, at least you know why it is, why we are doing this. So section 4.2 is basically saying, what if the complex you know, expression is an or, okay? So once again, C and D are placeholders, okay? C by itself can be super complex. D by itself can also be super complex. They're simply placeholders. But the most important thing is these two sub-expressions are connected by a logical or, okay? So how do we increase code complexity in terms of statements? and reduce the expression complexity. So we translate that into something that is simple like this, which basically just says, you know, if C by itself is true, let's go to label L1, because it's an or, because you know, in that case, if at least one side is true, the whole thing has to be true. So if I have confirmed that condition C by itself is true, I don't have to look at D, right? And by the way, this is also called short-circuited evaluation, which means I only evaluate what I need and I can ignore the rest once I have already know, known that, once I know that I have to go to L, label L1, I'm not even going to bother with D. Now, short-circuited evaluation may sound like something that's trivial. We are just gaining efficiency, but that's not what it is, okay? It is far more important than just gaining efficiency. Because in the original form, okay, forgetting about the context that we are doing your know, translation C code into assembly code, in the original context of just, you know, we have some complex expression C, we have some complex uh, expression D here. D can involve auto increment, auto decrement. It can involve calling a subroutine that has a lot of side effects. So that means when you are not calling D, it's not just saying that, oh, I'm saving some time to evaluate an expression, because you're basically saying all the side effects associated with condition D is also gone. So that means 
it may not make sense to reverse those two. You might need to check D before you check, you might need to check C before you check D. So doing it in the reverse way may not work anymore. Okay? So do we have any questions about the equivalency between this code here and what it becomes, you know, which is this code over here? So we good? Kind of makes sense, okay? And with conjunction, it's about the same, except it just looks a little bit weirder, okay? So if the original one is saying if C and D are both true, let's go to label L1. The translator code is basically first confirming whether C is false or not, okay? Because guess what? This is a conjunction. If C is known to be false, which means not C is going to be true, we are not going to go to L label L1. So at that point, you know, if C is false, we can just go ahead and decide, let's go to the continuation point and not even bother to evaluate D. Does that make sense? This is also another form of short circuit evaluation, which in some, you know, some people call it lazy evaluation. It means exactly the same thing. The short circuit evaluation of AND is used far more frequently compared to the short circuit evaluation of OR. And that's because a lot of times we set up C to be what we call a guard condition, which means if C is true, then it makes sense to evaluate D. Usually it has to do with boundary checking. When you're working up the array you know, index you know, in a loop or something like that, you want C to confirm that are we still in scope? Is the index still within the scope of the, uh, what, the number of elements in the array? If it is, then go ahead and actually make references to those elements. Otherwise, don't even bother, okay? Because your index is already out of range, so don't even bother to look into the array. Or in some cases, you can check whether a pointer is null or not. If C says you know, the pointer is already null, don't bother to dereference it. Is that okay? So once again, okay, I'm just repeating myself, but it really is important. Short circuit evaluation is not just about efficiency. It is, it's basically a part of the structure of programming. It doesn't look like it, but it really is. And that's why it has more importance than it seems. Okay, yep. So in core point one, why do we get rid of the, the not symbol for the transformation, but in core point three, we use the not symbol? We introduce a not, that is correct. But that's okay, because after this, then we can recursively apply your 4.1 to get rid of the negation. So, the, so these transformations, you basically apply one, it might, after the transformation, it might necessitate the application of another one, but it's okay. We just basically, we, try, we apply the pattern, we get, end up with a new code, and then we analyze the new code using exactly the same rules and apply whatever is applicable until there's nothing applicable anymore. So it's a repetitive process. All right. So those are the things about you know, handling Boolean operators you know, as a part of the expression. So now we are moving on to section 4.4, which is basically saying uh, sometimes we don't need to do that. Okay? So sometimes the negation can be handled without complicating the code itself. So that means you know, you sometimes, you know, since you're the compiler, we can look for things like this, okay? Because if the negation is x is greater than or equal to y, we can just go like, oh, I don't have to you know, apply section 4.1 because I can use algebra to say co the confirmation that x is not greater than or equal to y is the same thing as the confirmation of x is just less than y. Does that make sense from the algebra perspective? Okay, so in this case, I can do this without complicating the code at all, and yet I'm removing the negation operator. Or sometimes you have an or you know, expression like this. So if this is the, the original expression using an or, so instead of you know, complicating the code and breaking it up, having two conditional statements and whatnot, you can go like, oh, so all we are really trying to confirm is x does not equal to y. Okay, cool. Okay, so whenever it makes sense to use algebra to do the negation or the disjunction or the conjunction, do that, okay? Because you're basically simplifying, removing 
um, logical operators, but without complicating the code. Because you're, you're applying you know, algebra tricks you know, from the number perspective. All right, so I'm gonna pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions about what we have talked about so far. Section three applies to statement level translation. Section four applies to ex <coughs> expression level you know, reduction. So between those two, eventually you boil down to the very basic Boolean expressions. So with any type of program, okay, any type of code, what do you think are the most basic Boolean expressions? There's a big hint on the screen. <laughs> yep, comparisons, okay. So basically everything boiled down to just comparison. Um, so that's why, you know, section five basically says, okay, now that we have boiled everything down to the most elemental ones, which are basically comparisons, what do we do then? So now you basically, first, you know, the first thing we have to realize is uh, how many different kinds of comparisons do we need? Well, I claim that we only need to confirm whether something is less than something else. So let's check out why that is the case. If you want to confirm that x is greater than y, oh, we can always just use less than, just flip the right-hand side and the, right, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we're done. Okay, that's an easy one. If you want to confirm x is less than or equal to y, then we can say x is less than y or x equals to y. So like, but x equals to y is not less than. Why do we want to introduce x equals to y? That goes, yeah. Oh, okay. So why do we, why is x equals to y just as good? This goes back to the flags in the ALU. Which flag do you think has something to do with the confirmation that two things are the same? Yeah. Zero flag. The zero flag, okay. The zero flag after a compare confirms that whatever you're comparing are the same. Because a compare is basically a subtraction. So if you have two values that are the same and you're subtracting one from the other one, what do you get? You get zero. <coughs> So when you get a zero, the Z flag is confirmed, and do we have a conditional branch instruction that specifically says, if the Z flag is a one, let's go over there. We have five conditional branch instructions. Yes, oh, okay, I thought you, you were raising your hand. So we have JCI, JZI, right? So JZI is, ex is exactly the one that can say, oh, by the way, if X equals to Y, let's go, okay? <clears throat> so that's why zero equal to is important to us. Uh, X is greater than or equal to Y, well, just flip the order, you'll be fine. Uh, X equals Y, we don't have a problem because of the Z flag, we like that. And this one is just a negation of X equals to Y. So in this particular translation, we did necessitate and basically throw us all the way back to section 4.1 because you know, now we have a not equal to or the negation of equal to. So we have to get basically boil down to, if equal to, go to continuation point, otherwise go to the label that I originally wanted to go to. So that means you know, there's some interaction between the comparison translation with the earlier you know, section, which is section four, which has to do with reducing the complexity of expressions. All right, so now that we can boil everything down to just comparison, and making the assumption that whatever value we are comparing are put into two specific registers. One is register X, which can be register A, B, C, or D. The other one is Y, which is also you know, one of the four registers. So now the question is, what are we gonna do? Now, in this case, R is a placeholder of the comparison operator. And we have already talked about how less than is great, okay? Because you know, the B flag is good for X is less than Y unsigned. The L flag is good for X is less than Y signed, okay? So we can handle less than, okay? Less than is good. Equal to is equally good, okay? Okay, that was not a pun intended, but it does go kind of nice. So equal is equally good, okay? Because we got the Z flag, okay? After a compare, we can confirm whether two things are the same or not. 
So now the question is, how do we translate that into assembly code? Well, it turns out it's really easy. Whatever this R is, okay, it's just going to specify the conditional branch instruction. So what we need to do, once you have the value of x, which is an expression, you load it into a register, and you have to the value of y register, you have the value of y loaded into a register. So just compare those two registers in this order, which means we are evaluating x minus y. And then whatever this r is, which can be less than or equal to, those are the only two r that the TCP ASM can natively handle. Just stash that r over here. So that means this r, okay, I'm going to say this. This is important, okay? You might want to write this down, not for this upcoming exam, but for the next exam and for the rest of the semester, this is going to come in handy. For signed comparison less than, R should be L. For unsigned comparison less than, R should be a C. For equal to, which is not sensitive to signedness as at all, R should be a Z. So those are the only three flags that we commonly use in this class after a comparison. Yep. Sure. I will even okay, I'll do it even a better job here. Okay. <clears throat> if okay, why oh it's not working because it's off. There we go. So if X is oh, okay, I shouldn't use that. Give me a second, let me fix that. So x r y go to l something. So signed less than. So this is uh, r. This is the flag we're going to use. So signed less than is going to use l. Sign unsigned less than is C, and equal to is just Z. So now you can just take a note, take note of what time it is right now, which is 11.42. After the recording is posted, go to that time frame, <laughs> freeze the uh, replay, and then just kind of crop this portion, and you know, paste it into your note. <clears throat> or you can do it by hand. Okay? So, but, okay, even though I gave you all this information here, you still might want to remember why that is the case. In other words, when we talk about comparison, you know, or binary compar comparison, what is the L flag? How is the L flag computed? Oh, it's the exclusive or between the sign and the overflow. The sign flag is easy. It's just the most significant of the most significant bit of an integer. But why is it important? Okay, what is the significance of the sign flag in that particular expression? And then what is the overflow flag? The overflow flag means the sign of the result of public test. So what does that mean, right? So you might want to go back to those discussions to fully understand why sign less than is really just looking at the L flag. And then for the same reason, you might want to go back and re-examine why unsigned less than is just looking at the C flag. Now, you might say, but it doesn't make sense because the C flag is carry, and carry is only useful after an addition. But because of the ALU, how it is structured, we also have the borrow flag after a subtraction to go to exactly the same bit position. And that's why the carry flag is also the borrow flag. Yep. No, the okay. shift out thing is is there's no capturing of the shifted the, the the value that is shifted out, and also because it's a right shift, it does not make sense to shift it into the carry flag, because a left yeah. shift makes sense in a certain way that it will shift into the carry flag, but the right shift is shifting things, it's shifting the least significant bit out, which in most cases is just tossed away because it's not important. Okay. Yep. All right. So getting back to the notes, okay, we only got a few more minutes to go, five more minutes. So that is how we translate, you know, like in this case, you know, this is a, an example. 
if x is a register containing a unsigned value and y is also a register containing an unsigned value, then you know, this code here translates to this code in assembly. So that, okay, so combining sections three, four, and five, now we know how to translate a C program all the way down to TTPSM from the perspective of, of control structure. Is that okay? All right. But the nice thing about this particular process is you don't have to do everything all at the same time. Because until we get to section five, if you look at section three and four, all of these transformations are still in C. We start off with C code, we transform that into uglier looking C code, nonetheless. So that means, you know, oh, you don't have to worry about, oh, I have to trace the execution in TTP, blah, blah, blah. No, none of that, okay? At the end of applying the tricks in section four, you still end up with a C program, which means you can still use GDB, you can still use online GDB, you can still use Webflip, you can use code blocks, you can still use VS Code. All of those tools can still help you debug the program. Does that, does that make sense? And you can do it in gradual steps, right? You know, if you know how to use Git, GitHub, or you know, similar tools to help you, you know, keep track of revision, now you can say, okay, this is the original code. I know how to test it. These are the test cases that I'm going to go through to make sure the code still behaves exactly the same way. So what do you do? You perform a few transformations. You test the code again. If it is still doing what it is supposed to be doing, then you check it in into your repository and go like, okay, as far as I can test, the, the program is still doing the same thing. Then you do some more transformation. You check it in again. You perform more transformation. You check it in again. It doesn't have to be one single gigantic step. Is that okay? So the transformation that you do with step three is gradual because you can basically do partial translation, test the program again, make sure everything is still good, perform some more transformation. The same thing with section four. It can be very gradual. It's only by the time you're done with both three and four, section three and section four, then you really have to boil things down to the assembly language level and then, you know, at that point, you're going to have to translate the entire program into assembly and make sure that it does what it is supposed to do. But that's a much more mechanical translation at that point because the meaning of what does it mean to have a loop here or what does it mean to have a conditional statement here? Oh, this conditional statement is, is inside the loop. That loop is the then statement of this conditional statement, blah, blah, blah. All of that is already taken care of. And you're just focusing on Oh, we are comparing this to that, okay? Let's compute this, stash it into a register, compute that, stash it into a different register. Then you perform the simple compare thing, and then the conditional branch, done. All righty. I don't have enough time to go through an actual example of how to apply these particular tricks, so we can do that on Wednesday, well, next Monday, because Wednesday is your exam too. There is an example right after this, okay? And that's why when you look at the thumbnail, you go like, Tech, are we really just about a quarter through this whole thing? Sounds like we got everything covered. Yes, we got everything covered. Because after this, we have, you know, well, we have, there's a short discussion of how to name your labels, but that's a personal thing. You know, most people say, you know, the way that I name the labels is a little bit too, you know, structured and too mechanical. Okay, fine, do it whatever you want, right? But the rest of this thing is an example. Section seven basically is more than one half of the entire module. Start with some code. I don't ask you what it does and why it's doing it like that because I'm just using it as an example of how to translate. So it basically just go through variations, okay? It just goes through all of these things here to perform one step at a time you know, of translation. So it is a little bit involved, okay? So the way you read this is really just to compare this code with whatever is before that, and then look at the next revision and compare that versus the previous one. If you have a diff tool, you know, that's gonna be helpful because it will highlight exactly what changes has been made. Um, but that's basically the whole thing. I mean, this, this is right, really the rest of the whole thing, and that's why it's so long, because I am giving you a very slow process of translating the code into assembly 
and then repeating the whole process. So basically, you're looking at a program that is gradually turning from C into assembly code. But there's explanation between all the steps too, which is which are basically the application of the techniques of sections three, four, and five mostly. All right. So what you're doing today in the lab is something not quite intense like this. <laughs> what you're doing is um, taking the absolute value of a particular integer. So the absolute value of negative three is three. The absolute value of three is three itself. So you're just writing the code in TTP ASM to accomplish that. Um, the, okay, so let me point you to the lab right now. Okay, so let me go back to, Module. You cannot see the lab just yet because I have not un I have not shown that yet. Okay, now they are shown. So if you refresh your browser, you should be able to see absolute value. There are two. Um, the first one is basically a typical lab thing that you can participate, like a multiple choice thing. And then the second one is code uh, submission. So you basically have to submit the TTP ASM code, and that's why I emphasized earlier about how to turn in TTP ASM files because that's what you're gonna need to do today. Um, the access code is just ABS, which is absolute value, so it's not really <coughs> funny in any way. So it's just ABS for the lab. Um, and that's it. I think uh, we got everything. Yep. I forgot. What is the definition of jump? JMPI? Yeah, it's JMP like Well, there's JMP and then there's JMPI. We are going to use JMPI. Oh. Okay. So you go to the optical table, that's where you find all the descriptions. I know, but like, I never understood like the definition of jump is itself. Just move to the next line? The continuous execution where you tell it to using the immediate operand. Oh, okay. So JMPI is right this, right here. And whatever you specify as I is the address that will that the JMPI instruction will continue execution after its own execution. Mm -hmm. All righty. All right. So I am gonna go back to my office, get a sip of water, and then I'll come back here to answer any questions. But before that, let me stop the recorder.